Yeah. Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. May please, my lords. My lord, I would like to take off from where Mr. Sibyl left off. Uh, I think the question of plenary powers has been adequately addressed. I will not address yes. that except yes. to say. Yes. Mr. Sibyl and Ms. Jaising to just indicate who they are appearing for. Yes, that we I, have that I want yes, to say that. that. But I didn't ask you your repetition. Yes, yes. Lord, I'll give you my repetition. My note, my lord, who I'm appearing for. My lord, let me give you my repetition numbers. It's the very first one on board, 274 of 2009 which was originally titled Assam Public Works, now called INRI Section 6A. I'm appearing as an impleted respondent in the first writ petition. We do what we have done in the three seven. It's now called INRI 6A. Prabhu, what fell from Ms. Jaising a moment ago, as we have done in the case of the marriage equality, Article yes. 370, can we call can we call the judgment in re 6 a of well, the Lord, I would agree with yes. that. Yes. Respectfully yes. agree. Mr. Divan, I think. Yes. That's already there. That's already there. Yes, it's already showing on the board as in re 6 a It's showing on the board as in re 6 a so what is the But, my Lord, since the question has been asked who I'm appearing for, I'm appearing for an impleted respondent in writ petition number 274 of 2009 which is the first item 501 on board today. You are applying for the impleted respondent. Impleted respondent in all Assam Minority Students Union is the name of the respondent. I am also appearing, my lord, for an impleted respondent in writ petition number 562 of 2012. This is the petition in which the order of reference has been made to this court. That is this a reference. Number, number. 562 of 2012. There again, you are appearing for one For an respond. impleted respondent, uh, uh, impleted by an order dated 23-8-2013. Yes. And the latter, my lord, is the one in which the reference has been made. Now, my lord, as I said, uh, let me uh, begin with where Mr. Where Mr. Sybil has left off. Well, Lord, it has been said by academics the world over that the 21st century is the century of refugees and migrants. And if you shift it one century back, then the 19th century also was a century of refugees and migrants insofar as India is concerned. My first submission is that the Constitution of India bears the birthmarks of partition. And you cannot understand either the Constitution of India or the Citizenship Act without understanding what happened at the, for almost a century before the partition occurred. And what led up to this partition. And the birthmarks are there in the Constitution. Article uh, 5 confines itself to the commencement, as has already been said. Six and seven deal with migration to and from Pakistan, and the Citizenship Act deals with acquisition of citizenship after the Constitution comes into force. My submission is going to be Section 6A is a sui generis provision. And that's why it's called special provision. So it cannot be slotted either into the Constitution or into Section 4 and 5. Possibly it can be slotted into Section 7 of Article 7, a proviso. Because my submission is the proviso to Article 7 leaves the door open for further migration and does not freeze the cutoff date at 19th March 1947. 1948, 1948. There's no freeze to migration, or there's no freeze to granting citizenship to people who enter India after 17th March 1948. And that is obvious from a reading of the proviso to Article 7. I'll make good that submission. Then, my lord, I'll address a few issues on Article 29, because I, 14 has been adequately addressed. 11 has been adequately addressed. I will not cover the same ground. But Lord, in my opinion, 29 has not been adequately addressed, and I'll attempt to do so. In fact, the Attorney General did not address 29 at all. I'm sorry, the uh, Solicitor General made no submissions on Article 29. And my Lord, from what I understood by the opening arguments of Mr. Devan, 
his major focus was on 29. And that major focus was confined to demographic changes. Nothing more, nothing less. It was not his case that the script, the language, or the culture of Assam has been impacted. If it was, I have not understood in what manner. And may I explain, my lord, I would like to invite your attention to certain provisions of the Constitution of India. Assamese continues to be in the schedule of official languages of India. Point number one. One second. Under the Constitution, adequately, completely protected. No question, my lord, of destruction of the language. Number two. Assamese continues to be the official language of the state of Assam. Remember, my lord, at one time, Mr. Sibyl informed you that Bengali was forcibly made the language of Assam. That was reversed. And Assamese continues to be the official language of the state of Assam. Therefore, my lord, there's complete protection of language script. language of the state. Bengal is also the official yes. language of the state. Yes. And Boro is also an official language. Yes, my lord. I'm grateful Assam for that information. Assam is not the only. My lord, I'm very grateful for that information because we are talking about a state which is bilingual. And therefore, my lord, what is the point of producing data to show the number of Assamese speaking people as against the number of Bengali speaking people in the state of Assam? It makes no sense. It's a bilingual state, a, a multilingual state. And as Mr. Sibyl submit, uh, submitted, my lord, it is one of the most diverse states in the country because of the mass migrations that have taken place over the centuries, my lord, long before the Ahoms came to India, long before that. There has been migration into Assam. And this has led to the creation of a syncretic culture. No submissions were advanced on how the culture of Assam has been impacted. Now, a lot of few more provisions of the Constitution of India need to be pointed out to see the special protection given to the state of Assam. First of all, Please under Article 342, the president of in, in, in the, the, the parliament passes laws naming scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in different states. And my lord, I will uh, share it with you because it's in the public domain. There is a law of parliament in 1976, which gives you the names of the tribes who have been put in the presidential schedule. The intention being to protect their culture. These are constitutional provisions for protection of culture, which are in place. Then, my lord, your lordship will turn to Article 244 of the Constitution of India. I'm going through the list of constitutional provisions which are intended to protect the state of Assam, and in particular, the tribals. My learned friend, Mr. Devan said, each of his petitioners represent a certain tribe. And I presume it was his case that it was tribal culture which is being destroyed. Now, my lord, we turn to 244 of the constitution. Yes. Administration of scheduled areas and tribal areas. The provisions of the fifth schedule shall apply to the administration and control of scheduled areas and scheduled tribes in any state other than the states of Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, and Mizoram. Special provisions have been made for these states given their history. Now, my lord, the provisions of the sixth schedule shall apply to the administration of the tribal areas of the states of Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, and Mizoram. Then come to Article 244A. 
formation of autonomous states comprising certain tribal areas in Assam and creation of local legislative and council of ministers of both thereof. There again, my Lord, there's a special dispensation for self-governance of tribal areas. One of the submissions made was self-governance is covered by Article 21. No attempt was made to justify that submission, but I'm giving you the answer. If self-governance is a right, yes, it is protected insofar as Assam is concerned in relation to tribals under Article 244A. Tribal areas have been put in a separate schedule which gives them autonomy of administration. Now, below, these are the provisions which conserve customs. And if custom and culture are synonymous with each other, then their culture is protected. Uh, please don't un understand me to say custom and culture are synonymous. They are not. But nevertheless, assuming for a moment that culture and custom are synonymous, my lot, they are adequately protected by the Constitution of India, and no case has been made out for violation of rights under 29 which was the major argument addressed by the opening argument. Now, my lord, this being said, please turn to Article 247. I'm sorry, it's not 247. It's 27. Yes, you have. Yes, he has. Page but read this article. Of page 49 of the... Uh, yes, so there is a list. There is a 133. list, but I would like you to see the provisions of those articles, 275, 275. My Lord, your Lordship talked about development. Here is the answer to development. It's already there, it's, it's grants from the Union to certain states. Mandatory grants for Assam, my Lord, not for the rest of the country. Yes. Please have a look. It is for what? For development. Mandatory. Whereas the others are at the discretion of the Union of India, when it comes to Assam, the word is shall, provided that there shall be paid out of the Consolidated Fund of India a grant in aid of revenue for the state of Assam, sums capital and recurring equivalent to A, B, C, D, E. Therefore, Milot, the brief submission that I'm making is that the Constitution adequately protects the right to culture of the residents of Assam. Now, my Lord, I want to move to another issue. My learned friend used the expression throughout his arguments, indigenous people. Please note that the Constitution of India does not use the word indigenous anywhere. It uses tribes. I, for one, my Lord, do not know who is an indigenous person of Assam. I don't know because there is no legal definition of indigenous person in the Constitution of India. There is a definition of scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, and my lord, the rest of us who are citizens of India. So, my lord, kindly be a bit cautious about the use of the word indigenous. Instead, we can use the word tribes. The question then will be is the culture of tribes endangered? in any manner, and if so, by whom? Now, my lord, let's see the plain reading, plain wording of Article 20, 29, just the straightforward reading. And my lord, it, it certainly surprised me. I don't know whether this court will be surprised, but in the last 75 years of the functioning of this court, I have been unable to find a judgment which defines what is culture. Or inter I was looking very hard, my Lord, to see if I could find a judgment which I could present to you, which would precisely give you the content of the meaning of the word culture so that it would enable us to decide when is it uh, undermined. But there is none, to the best of my knowledge. Not my research could be limited, but this is my submission before you. Now let's read Article 29 and see what we can make out of it on our own. Without reference to any guidance from precedence. Protection of the interests of minorities. My Lord, interestingly, the 
title of 29 differs from its content. Although it refers to interests of minorities in its title, in its content, it refers to all citizens, any section of persons. So the right to culture can be conserved by minority and majority citizen, citizens. So if you read it, any section of the citizens residing in the territory of India, it doesn't say any minority citizens. Any section of the citizens residing in the territory of India or any part thereof, having distinct language, script, culture of its own, shall have the right to conserve the same. The next one, Milord, we are not concerned. It's about preserving educational institutions. It's nobody's case that any educational institution has been destroyed. So now, my lord, I would ask myself the question, how does one understand the word culture in Article 29? As I said, finding no guidance from the court, I tried to present something in my written submissions, uh, culling out information from several authors around the world. And what we found, my lord, is that it is an expression which is notoriously vague. So if your lordship turns to volume two, volume two, page 74, under the heading submissions to the challenge based on culture. It is submitted that Indian culture, including Assamese culture, is syncretic in nature. For want of a better word, I use the word syncretic. Freedom of movement and residence and settlement throughout the territory of India effectuate and, and comprise part of India's syncretic culture and unity. But Lord, why do we have this freedom of movement across the country? In order to preserve our syncretic culture, we are allowed to go anywhere, do anything, and all our fundamental rights. Tomorrow I can migrate, but I don't know. Indian law does not recognize citizenship of a state. Let's be clear about that. We are citizens of India. And my Lord, in answer to the question, why is ordinary residence so important in our citizenship laws? Wait, I'll be reading this further. I want to point to one thing. If you see Article 5 of the Constitution of India, it uses the word domicile. At the commencement of the Constitution, every person who has his domicile in the territory of India. This is the significance of ordinary residence, permanent intention to permanently settle. Lord, even domicile is, uh, is not a very well-defined uh, concept. But taken from private international law, we know that domicile means the place where you reside with the intention of making it your home. That's the definition of domicile. And well, domicile, in fact, in this country has caused a lot of problems given the federal nature of the, of the country. When it comes to things like admission to medical colleges, my lord, and states make reservations for people who are domiciled in their states, all those disputes have landed up in court. Whether any such preference can be given to domicile, and it remains, I think, an unresolved issue. But the reason I'm pointing to domicile is there are two running threads in the Constitution Part 2 and the Citizenship Act. One is the concept of permanent residence and intention to settle. And the other is persons of Indian origin. And here I would say Indian origin necessarily has to refer to undivided India because Article 6 and 7 give them citizenship. So there's a running thread in the Constitution to give citizenship to persons of Indian origin. In fact, Lord, the demand, as your Lordship knows now, is that NRIs and overseas citizens should be given citizenship. And the late Mr. Ellen Singh, we had agreed to this, uh, after which we got the concept of long-term visas and overseas citizens, uh, where the government now issues those cards. And currently, my Lord, there are petitions pending before you, uh, which talk about why we should not be allowed to have 
dual citizenship of different countries. Now, of course, I don't want to get into that issue. But what I want to emphasize, my Lord, is that these are the two running threads. So three running threads. One, the birthmark of partition. Two, the concept of giving citizenship to those who make their domicile in India. And three, persons of Indian origin. Now, my Lord, Article 6A satisfies all these three conditionalities. In principle, procedure, etc., is a different issue. But all these three conditionalities are satisfied by Article 6A. These are the three conditionalities. As, as Section 6A of the Citizenship Act, my Lord, and therefore its constitutionality must be viewed in that context. Which are the three conditionalities? One is the, the relevance of the birthmark of, of partition in this country. The second is the intention to reside permanently in India. And the third is a person of Indian origin, India being defined as undivided. These are the three guiding principles for determining the constitutional validity of 6A. Has Parliament gone beyond these principles? What it is has the second not. one, ma'am? The second one, my lord. The second one is intention. the intention to reside permanently or resettle, settle or resettle within the territory of India. So, my lord, when it comes to culture, I'll just conclude by saying, if, I'll just take you back to my written submissions to show you how notoriously vague the concept is. Now, actually, you know, if you really look at that, culture is such an amorphous concept. Culture is a, you can say in so many ways, a product. I was just identifying, you know, what goes into culture. You say Indian culture. Is there an Indian culture? And then so all of us believe there is an Indian culture yes. because we belong to this syncretic culture of the nation. But what is it? What goes into it? You can say language. Yes. Not that your language is culture, but our relationship to our language is an equally a part of uh, culture. You have, your, identity you have your aphorisms, you have your colloquialisms, they're going to sort of making up your culture. Yes. Art, art, belief, uh, language, yes. customs. Uh, See, I've identified a few things. Cul language, customs, social institutions. Yes, ma'am. Religion. But your religion. Yes, yes, my lord, uh, all of that. Practices. Yes, my lord, all food. of that. So Food. 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 Apparel. Yes. Uh, geographical conditions. Yes. Relationship with nature. Yeah. For instance, you go up to Ladakh, you go to Zanskar, you realize that, you know, the culture is a product of your relationship with nature when you travel to those uh, areas. Or you go down to, you go down to, say, the west coast of Maharashtra, you will see so much of use of coconut. Why? Because of the fact that coconuts grow there. Or you go down to Kerala. So, even that, that's all, it all goes into the, uh, the, into the generation of a cultural tradition. So culture is not specific to one of any of these items, but is a unique, is, is, an, is, is an interplay of all this that produces a culture. Music, music has a very important bearing on the production of culture. Respect to law and order. It's a way of living. Respect towards, respect towards law. That's why in certain parts you see people are more into nuts. Well, look, with respect, I agree. Uh, all these elements make up culture and it's an aspect of our identity. But my Lord, your Lordship will also bear in mind that we self-identify with a particular culture. It's a self-identity with a particular culture. Nobody is forcing it on us. And my Lord, we cannot forget that this country was reorganized on linguistic lines by the State's Reorganization Act. At the end of the day, my lord, the country was, entire country was reorganized on linguistic lines because language is an important element of identity of a human being. This is the reason why it was reorganized on linguistic lines. So, and this is why language is protected, especially under Article 29, under the right to culture. 
Well, there have been so many language disputes in this country. A lordship knows whether the three language formula should be adopted, whether Hindi should be enforced on non-Hindi speaking states. The disputes are endless, but it's because there is so much identity with language. An individual identifies to such an extent with language that it's a separately protected right under the constitution. So, my lord, I've gone on to explain that uh, it's notoriously amorphous uh, and it's a notoriously overbroad concept. And I have finally come to the conclusion, my lord, that judicially, your lordship can only accept constitutional culture, constitutional morality as the culture of every citizen of India, in addition to any other culture that they may have. Why has this court taken such pains to emphasize the issue of constitutional morality in this country? Because we are a secular country, my lord, and because every section of the citizens have their rights separately guaranteed. And my lord, insofar as religion is concerned, my lord raised religion as part of culture. It is separately protected under Article 25. But everything that of this is separately protected. Yes. Your right to food is protected by 14. Language is protected independently. Yes. But culture is what emerges from this, the interplay between all these. It's yes. a way of living as Brother Sundarish. But said. it's self-identity self with the culture. Nobody can tell me you identify with somebody else's culture. We create our own cultural communities. And we identify with them. And there are subcultures as well. We all say that we have a culture as Indians. But we then also have culture, we have also a culture as belonging to the state where you come from, yes, the area of the state where you come from. So, my lord, that my, uh, my conclusion, and I won't bother you with it, is that when this court is venturing to answer the question, if at all, what is culture, my lord, kindly bear in mind that we already have a constitutional culture in this country built up through precedence of this court and through the very document that we are reading today. And I would say that it is the, that constitutional culture which cannot be endangered. Thank you, Ms. Jaisin. Thank yes. You. Lord, uh, one more. Uh, there, is, uh, there, is, uh, there are some questions that I need to answer. In the list of dates I've given, Lord, in fact, a very, very famous senior counsel of this court has migrated to India. In his autobiography, he records that he migrated from Burma to this country. So who is Indian, who is not? Who is Assamese? There is no definition of Assamese at all. We are only resident from Burma to India. <laughs> well, Assam. And Assam was part of Burma, actually, and then ceded to India under a treaty with the Burmese. So, my lord, the, the, uh, as Mr. Sibyl had uh, indicated, the uh, cross-migration that has taken place in Assam includes Hindu, Muslim, Christian. A lot of the tribals are Christian, my lord, in the, in, in the state of Assam. Those who have gone into the autonomous areas. Therefore, my lord, to present demography, my point is only this. I'll just read out one small paragraph that to offer demographic, uh, demographic data as evidence of impacting culture is not constitutionally acceptable. And I'll read it out, but I'll just give you the three reasons why. Because, my lord, the statistics don't tell you what were the causes of this demographic change. Now, my lord, what could be the causes of demographic change? I, I'll spell them out to the best of my knowledge. It could be, my lord, at the basic level, the argument expresses on the uh, moves on the assumption that demographic profile has changed primarily on account of cross-border illegal migration. That's the argument. Why? An increase or decrease in demography may be on account of various factors like fertility rates, interstate migration, illegal migration, etc. The petitioners have not been able to demonstrate through any reliable data as to the cause of the alleged demographic change and the quantum of demographic change due to immigration. The only data that has been provided is the increased proportion of Muslims as compared to the average rate of growth of population in the state of Assam. But 
the data shows that the growth rate of Muslims is lesser than that of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in those states. Also, growth rate of Muslims in Assam is lesser than, lesser than in MP, Maharashtra, Haryana. That's merely because of average growth rate of the state does not. Yeah, last point. Well, there's just one other issue, if I may seek your indulgence, which I need to address. References have been made to the fact that immigration is external aggression. This is, to say the least, my lord, an argument of alarm. In migration, my lord, could be on account of distress. Said I am arguing, my lord, that that judgment requires to be overruled. Do it or don't do it, that's your option. But I, one minute, yes, if it's not an issue, fine. But I just want to put it on the... My Lord, please, now please, now please. It's in the very order of reference. No, my Lord, so no one says that. Now, what are my reasons for not saying it, my Lord? Article 352 of the Constitution of India, which talks about declaration of an emergency, uses the expression war, external, external aggression, or armed rebellion. Therefore, my Lord, the word external aggression must be read. You just am generous with war, but suppose a cyber attack is launched on one of our states. Government of India can say we are duty bound under Article 355. Of course, to protect. No, I don't deny that. So external aggression today what? is a very broad, it could be a cyber attack, for instance. But, no, but internal, be... I'm not, to one minute, I'm not talking about internal disturbance. Internal disturbance, obviously the union has a duty to protect every state from internal disturbance. I'm saying, can you refer to migration as external aggression? My answer is no. Now, one minute, my Lord, in that very judgment, the criteria of whether it is external aggression or not is dependent on what is the animus, uh, belligerent, belligerent, what is the animus of the person who is being aggressive is the touchstone to decide whether it's external aggression or not. If it's a belligerent intent, it is external uh, uh, aggression. Now, migration that has taken place, especially from the subcontinent, the undivided subcontinent, is a distress migration. It's a migration which has taken place, my lord, with the intention of finding safe harbor in India. You may not want them in your sovereign right. You may want to get rid of them, but to describe them as external, as you aggressive. Your point. You as your point. What you are saying is that people who have migrated have, at the least, come in search of a safe harbor, or they they are fleeing external conditions of atrocities or violence, and the uh, therefore the, the the attempt is not to have to destroy the Indian social fabric, but to protect their own way of living. That is the touchstone for point. deciding whether it's external. And yeah, no, excuse me, it is in a black and white judgment of this court. And that's why it's my duty what to address it, my lord. And my learned friend read it out specifically. These are arguments of alarm. And my lord, it is my respectful request to you to revisit that passage. In that very judgment, you'll find the touchstone of animus belligerence belligerent side as the touchstone for deciding whether it is. And my lord, reference has been they have referred to a judgment of 1883 of the United States Supreme Court where Chinese immigrants were turned back. Now, my lord, those, the, those statutes of the Supreme of, of United States have been repealed uh, precisely because you cannot look at an immigrant as an aggressor. And finally, my lord, the, the judgments of the Supreme Court, which have been relied on in that judgment, were overturned in Trump versus Hawaii in 2018. Therefore, my Lord, there is a case made out by me for you to revisit that passage. I don't say don't address the question of uh, illegal immigration. If that's not my case, my Lord. All I'm saying is they cannot be described as aggressors, as it cannot be, the migration cannot be described as a form of external aggression. There may be so many remedies. And last, my Lord, to answer the question raised by Justice Sundaration, in the list of dates, there is an extant statute which it was enacted in 1950, which talks about expelling 
people from Assam. The, even that statute, it's at entry number 131950. Uh, 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 it's known as the Immigrants Expulsion from Assam Act 1950. And it gives to the union the power to expel an immigrant from Assam. But my learned friend has also pointed it out. Wait, it makes repeal. an exception. Repeal. If it's repealed, then I stand repeal. corrected. I stand yes, corrected. Repeal. All right, I won't refer to it. But at the relevant time, my lord, it exempted people who came due to civil disturbance. That question was asked, how do you describe these people? That's why I'm addressing it. Now, uh, we are almost concluded on this side. Almost, I said. Uh, who else? Mr. Hegde is there, Maluka is there, then... Five, uh, five, 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 five. So I'll just take three, four minutes. I appear to be as one well position. I'm supporting the United Solicitor General. Just three, four minutes. Yeah. Well, I just, just one note of... Point, which are not... Uh, can we now just... Very good can we suggest one thing? Can well, not... Uh, just, one, just one small lesson. Uh, can we just suggest this? The, let's get the order cleared. Sanjay uh, Chetan, just... Uh, sorry, Sanjay, just take it down. We'll first hear Mr. Sanjay Hegde. Well, the written then submissions Mr. are filed in the sequence. Mr. Uh, sequence. They, are, they are in volume two. No, let's, let us know that it is. But tell us, you tell us, we'll just put it down yeah, here. So, yeah, see, everybody knows who is who is first and who is next. Then I would have finished today. Yes, I, I won't take very long. All right. Then Mr. Uh, Sanjay Hegde, Mr. Anupam Lal Das, Mr. Then Mr. Siv Singh. Myself also, and then, I'll be I would like not to I'll take only five minutes because I have comprehensive written submissions. I'll just point the headings so that not in five minutes. I'll all all of you are now going to follow have filed the written submissions. Yes, can we just suggest one thing? Can we just suggest one thing? Who is the nodal council? Mr. Ayubi, Mr. also here. Right. So what we do is, everyone, please put down your whatever you want to say in not more than one page, bullet points. Give it to Diksha. Yes. So we will, uh, Diksha, you put it in the order in which we have now mentioned. Okay. We will look at those, that one page bullet points to just take us through that in rapid fire so that we'll finish in about, at the outer limit, say half an hour. So, uh, so in 11 o'clock, we will hand it over to uh, Mr. Devan, Mr. Yes, Chaudhary, and Mr. Hansaria to make the rejoinder. We'll wrap up by lunch. So, but do make sure that all of you have that one page bullet point so that we know exactly, while dictating the judgment becomes very complex otherwise. We know then what it exactly has been stressed by those who followed from the main council. President Roosevelt used to say, if it's important enough, only one point. <laughs> Give me my uh, uh, permission, my Lord, uh, just wanted to know the Lordship's pleasure regarding uh, that a Asia resurfacing, my Lord, is it to follow or not? Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Devedi, we are yes, just taking Asia resurfacing because it's a matter which is causing, you know, there's quite quite some uh, concern in the, dis in the in our district judiciaries because... So tomorrow your Lordship will take it Follow the order of the High Court the or, or the fact that yes, the, there's an order of the Supreme right. Court that's right. Because of course, you should take, take it up tomorrow. tomorrow. All stays will be deemed to be vacated after uh, yes. six months. So what we will do is that's a yes. different combination because I think just oh, and just Mithila joins. Yes. So yes. Perhaps if we finish this on Tuesday by lunch, or ideally let's begin after this gets over. Instead of keeping it say Tuesday after lunch, suppose this spills over by fifteen minutes. We can then keep it on Wednesday morning. I think that's much better. I don't think the whole matter should take more than an hour between Not, you and the... Uh, I appear for the uh, state of UP. We can't take more than half an hour. Mr. Divedi, how long will you take? Lord, uh, half an hour. All right. So, Wednesday morning, we'll keep it. It can be taken also on Friday, bro, if you lost it. So, when we find it's convenient. Friday will be miscellaneous, you know. Yes. We'll just let's do it on on Wednesday so that you know that yes. one hour we'd be there. So right. I just want to point out that bid petition uh, two seven four is before the, 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 the French submissions have come. So solicitor, if you are giving something, I, by I, I shall file it by Monday. Yeah. My Lord, this first bid petition is actually being monitored by a different bench. So I just want to say that the judgment in this case we hope will be confined only to constitutional validity. Because it covers a wide range of issues beyond constitutional validity, this repetition 274.
So the judgment will not dispose of 274. 6A and whatever we have passed an order, short order, where we want a disclosure by the Home Secretary. Oh, better.